Good morning, colleagues, friends. Thank you, Paul, for the invitation to this group. I come with a certain degree of trepidation because I am uh, not a scientist. I am a person interested in science, but my fields are in the humanities, uh, history, literature. And before we give you a summary of my chapter, I suggest that we pause for prayer. Father in heaven, we lift our voices to you this morning as we begin to think again about your great creation. We thank you for your wisdom and power and care for each one of us. And I pray that these moments that we will spend together will strengthen our faith in you and Sharpen our minds that you have given us in marvelous ways. Thank you for being a father and also for Jesus, our Savior. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Paul suggested I, I say something about the idea behind the book. And uh, it... One of the motives was my own experience as a university student, first in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and then in Palo Alto, California at Stanford. We are always asked questions when they discover that we are not Catholics or, or Protestants, that we are Adventists. So questions come very uh, frequently to us uh, for explanations. And I had been reading, I had the good fortune of having in Argentina a pastor that was himself a university student who could answer and give us counsel when we faced difficult questions. And this idea stayed with me as I worked in the General Conference Education Department and we launched a dialogue that was addressed to Adventist University students in public universities trying to give them some answers and some stimulus also to think things from the perspective of the Bible. So Jim and I, with whom I had the privilege of working in this project, we selected 20 of the most common questions that are asked uh, of us in professional circles and in other friendships. And we selected 20 of the most, commons, uh, most common questions, and we asked 20 or 18, in, 19 in my case, specialists to answer them. And to do that with a good uh, research foundation, but in a language that will be accessible. And we discovered jointly that there were advantages for us as co-editors and the authors to pose a question for the authors to answer. You know, sometimes when you're given an assignment and you're given a sort of a common uh, statement to be the title, you go far afield. But a question forces the author to answer that question. So many times we told the author, this is nice, but please answer the question that is the title of the chapter. And then we submitted it to Pacific Press and they accepted it with enthusiasm and in June or July of this year the book came out. One of the advantages in organizing a book like that is that you can read the chapters in any order that you are intrigued by a particular question you can go to that chapter and read it backwards or forwards or picking here and there uh, as the book came out we discovered that it was a timely book because there were questions and discussions within our circles about some of these deep issues dealing with creation evolution catastrophism and so on and the initial responses that we got from those who had read parts of it were positive, and there was a very nice uh, review uh, done by Joe Galusha in one of the publications that we read recently. The chapter that uh, we assigned to myself was why do different scientists interpret reality differently, which has always intrigued me as I read in scientific fields that is this scholar or researcher that presents this view as factual and, and there is other that comes against that and proposes a totally different, many times, 
different explanation or idea. So as w with the humility of being the non-scientist among the group, I'll give you a summary of uh, what I did in my chapter. The traditional image is that professional scientists approach their subject with a dispassionate attitude and arrive at objective conclusions that we need to take seriously. This is the image that the media proposes to us. Science says, and there is usually a name of the scientists or a group of scientists, and that is it. Uh, we know uh, that is not so. How do they work? Usually they use sophisticated equipment, they make careful observations, they conduct experiments when they can, they develop hypotheses, they propose theories, and reach conclusions. Science says. And yet, they frequently arrive at different conclusions. And in my chapter, I try to uh, say what are the possible explanations for this reality in the scientific field. And I propose three in uh, going from the surface to deeper ideas. Uh, the first one is that there are differences in the procedures or in the interpretations. For example, the size of the data is not reliable, or the design of the experiments and observations were not of the best kind. Sometimes it's a very simple thing. The equipment that you're using is not the best. There are others who have better telescopes or microscopes or equipment. Uh, and most commonly is human error in either handling the data or interpreting it. So what happens? Other scientists read the report, review the procedures, the data and the findings, and seek to replicate the observations or experiments in other parts of the world and decide where the weight of evidence is. And I put as an example something that intrigued me a great deal. In 1989, the two scientists from the University of Utah, as I recall, Fleischmann and Pons, announced that they had produced nuclear fusion at room temperature using heavy water and palladium electrode. Can you imagine the impact of that if we could do that? And it was a big splash in the media, in the scientific news, and uh, conferences were held. Uh, money was put in research, and all the other scientists that tried to reproduce that were unable to do that. And as a result, evidence, was said, does not support the original claim. Sorry, guys, you may have done it or thought you did it, but it cannot be done. We are unable to do it again. There is another <coughs> another possible reason uh, why scientists disagree, and that is to be working under different scientific paradigms. And I remember reading, I was uh, teaching at Andrews at the time, and not too far from the campus was the University of Chicago, and Thomas Kuhn published The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which to me was uh, an eye-opener because I'm interested in epistemology. And I read the 62, the 70 edition, and he, one additional edition was published posthumously. And his thesis, which has been discussed and continues to be argued upon, is that science, to the surprise of many, is not an empirically autonomous objective endeavor, but a collective activity influenced by social and historical factors. So sociology enters into the picture. And that may be an explanation why there are different interpretations of the data among the scientists. And he postulates that during periods of what he calls normal science, all scientists work within an acceptable paradigm. And when sufficient data and evidence does not fit into that model under which scientists work, a paradigm shift occurs. And you notice that two, two words enter into the language of the culture. It's a paradigm shift. And he used, as a, among many examples, this one here, the, how the Ptolemaic geocentric view of the universe 
was replaced by the heliocentric model of Copernicus. And I use as an, as an example something that has intrigued me since I was young, and is Wegener's model, or Wegener's model, of continental drift. He had proposed it in an article in a conference in the 1920s, I think 1927, because up to that time the idea is that continents were connected by land bridges that had collapsed. And he proposed not that there was a Pangaea, the term he uh, coined, that was uh, broken at a certain time in the past, and then the continents, to the surprise of many, uh, drifted apart. And in the 1960s, it was accepted as the real answer. A contemporary uh, paradigm-related discussion is the debate as to the causes of climate change, and particularly the increase of temperature. Is it caused by cycles in the solar system? Is it caused by human uh, produced emissions, the particularly the rise in temperature? Is it a mix of both? We are in the middle of that discussion even now that relates to a paradigm. The third one that I think is the deepest reason why scientists differ, particularly those who are creationists and those who are <coughs> not, is based on worldview based differences. And I elaborate in my chapter a little bit of how worldviews develop. All mature individuals have developed a worldview. It usually begins to take shape at adolescence and early adulthood with which we, you, understand, interpret, and explain reality. And I postulate here that worldviews answer both uh, four basic questions. Who am I? What is the origin, nature, and purpose of humans? Where am I? What is the nature and extent of reality? That is does it involve, in addition to what we can measure and observe, some transcendent realities or not? What is wrong? Why there is suffering and sickness and evil and violence and death? And what is the solution to these obstacles to human uh, fulfillment and happiness? There, we could extend the list, but those four really go at the core of the concept of a worldview. So worldviews provide the foundation for our values, our decisions, our relationships, our behavior, is the way we relate to the environment, how we vote, how we choose professions, and so on. And scientists, in spite of their desire to be objective and non-biased, bring to their investigations a set of assumptions regarding the universe and life that are based on the way they answer those questions. And I then summarize the three major worldviews. Theism that assumes the existence of a personal God, creator and sovereign of the universe in whose operation he acts, intervenes, interacts. So Judaism, Christianity and <coughs> the Islam are in that area. Pantheism, which is probably the second that developed, is the position that identifies an impersonal deity with the forces and workings of nature. So it's a, if there is a God, it's a God with a low case G that is equal to the universe. Naturalism, that also came rather early, uh, assumes that reality consists of the material universe operating according to natural laws plus nothing else. That is it. What we can measure, observe, manipulate, and so on is the worldview that I work with. But we need to remember and remind some of our colleagues that modern science was established in the 1950s to the 1700s precisely by Christian and theistic scientists of the stature of Copernicus and Galileo and Kepler and Pascal and Boyle and Newton and Halley and many others. They work within the parameters of a, of a worldview that assumes the existence of a God that worked in nature. And they decided to understand the mind of God by investigating nature. But during the last 150 years, the scientific community has embraced a naturalistic worldview 
that rejects a priori any supernatural intervention or transcendent meaning for life. At most, and this is a gesture of Stephen Gold from Harvard, he proposed the non-overlapping magisteria, the noma. That is, there are two levels of knowledge. One is the level of facts, and the other is the subjective level of beliefs and values. And we, as Bible-believing Christians who believe in the historicity of Jesus and Abraham and Moses, reject that position. No, they, what, was Jesus a, a real historical figure or not? So we reject this noma that he proposed. So I uh, propose then that every worldview can be summarized and told as, an, as a story. You have the uh, neo-Darwinian view. You can tell a story to explain how things came into being. And we as Seventh-day Adventists also have a worldview and a meta-narrative. And I try to outline what are the, I think, seven points of our meta-narrative that basically is a great controversy theme. There was creation in heaven, a perfect creation, with creatures that are intelligent and have free will. There is rebellion in heaven by one of the most brilliant and exalted creatures. Uh, creation on earth occurs at a certain moment. At the same time, this creature is expelled. There is disobedience, rebellion on earth. There is redemption through the agent of creation, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Uh, he has promised to return, to complete his mission, and there is consummation and recreation. And we share with other, with other Christians uh, points three, four, five, and six. We Adventists stretch a little bit, and I have dialogue with Protestant friends, and I said, well, where does the idea of the serpent that tempts come? Who is he or she or it? And we have a, a clearer, I think, sharper understanding and belief on that. So I think, at least for me and many of you, this worldview narrative is attractive because it offers a fairly satisfactory explanation for what we experience in life and gives meaning and transcendent hope to humans' deepest desires. And I think as, as the Adventist message spreads around the world, many individuals find this narrative of the worldview acceptable. So I'm coming to the end, and I want to remind ourselves of statements like this. Science does, science does not lead to certainty. Its conclusions are always incomplete, tentative, and subject to revision. The second is a quote that I was trying to find. I read it uh, many years ago. C.S. Lewis, uh, in one of his books, I still hope to find it, cautions Christians not to anchor their beliefs in current scientific theories or evidences. Otherwise, when these change, when these theories change, they will be forced to change their beliefs also. So it's happening backwards. And I think Ellen White several times reminds us that we must approach the study of nature from the perspective of the biblical revelation and not the other way around. And a conclusion, Christian scientists can work alongside colleagues who may, not, who may have a different worldview and yet achieve meaningful findings and respectable conclusions. This happens all the time, and I hope that we continue to do and do it even more. Yet, and this is an idea that I got from some of my scientific friends that have published and conducted research, yet those who believe in the Bible enjoy the advantage of having additional options and insights provided by the scriptures, which can generate research questions that may lead to fruitful hypotheses, explanations, and discoveries. That is my presentation, Paul. I hope I did it <coughs> quick enough. Any questions initially, and then we can, uh, uh, if there are none, we'll move on to uh, Dr. Gibson. I guess we have one here. I hope I can answer it. <laughs> it it's not very difficult. I really appreciate your presentation. I think it's very clear. 
and you exceeded my expectation oh of my. it. <laughs> so thank you very much. I have a question. This morning I watched a video, the story of a man who was raised a Catholic, then renounced Catholicism, became, became an evolutionist, atheist, and he rejected the idea of a God because when he was a student in school, the, the, the person in charge of giving religious instructions told him very clearly that his mother, who had died of cancer, who was a saint, his mother be, would be suffering in hell forever and ever because she was not a Catholic. So he rejected Catholicism. Then a series of very extraordinary events in involving the behavior of their baby. He would wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and feel that he was being strangled. And then the baby would start crying and the temperature would rise suddenly and they had to take it to the hospital. And this again and again. Finally, he thought, well, maybe in desperation I need the help of a priest. Well, a priest had some knowledge that he did not reveal to anybody. And he came, had a mass at their home, and the baby was delivered. Then, later on, through a series of circumstances, he came uh, with the Adventist beliefs. He was a university professor, a scientist, an evolutionist. He held the, one of the highest positions at the university. And then he had the problem. Because if he accepted Adventism, his he would lose his position. So what his is name is Walter Vaith. He went to La Sierra. He was invited to I speak see. there. And the claim is that very few people were interested in his story. So my question to you, are you familiar with what he teaches? I, I met Walter Vaith once with Jim in South Africa 20 years ago. OK, one additional detail. There is an article in Spectrum criticizing, demolishing this man in spite of the ex his experience. And I was led to this video thanks to Spectrum. <laughs> because right. somebody posted this uh, link. My question is, are you familiar? What do you think about this man? I will answer around it because I, I don't know much about this man. I know his story. We published a first-person story in dialogue some years ago relating some of the major shifts in his life. Uh, but I will answer it in this fashion. Most of the thinkers of Latin America, one of my fields was essay literature, most of the thinkers in Latin America were educated in Catholic schools. And when they reached university age or slightly after, they abandoned it. And as you read their essays and you talk to them, they say the major reason I abandoned the Catholic faith and the trust in God is this idea that God will punish by an eternity someone who has been a sinner for 60 years. And they have made many of them very militant, atheists against the Catholic Church. Uh, Benito Juarez is an example in Mexico. He, he nationalized all the properties of the Catholic Church. So there is the idea of the eternal punishment, with which, which is not taught in the Bible, and which we do not believe in is a major factor. The other factor, I was reading uh, uh, Darwin, 
uh, who, and his, his position, his, uh, his mistake is common among many scientists. When you observe nature as it is today, and you do not come at it with the idea that this is a nature that has been defaced by the rebellion at the beginning of human history, and then further damaged by the flood, then you look at predation, for example, and the cruelty in which all the animals live off each other. You say, if this is God, if this reflects the, the real character of God, I have my questions. Or worse, as he did, I reject that. So uh, my answer will be around your question. I do not know much about what the fight, but I would say, if you believe in eternal punishment for humans as a way in which God deals with sin, if you believe that what you observe in nature now reflects the original creation, you are bound to reject that God, that belief. Because rationally, you cannot believe that this is God. Thank you. By the way, just one, uh, one word uh, in addition. Yes. This man, Veit, is one of the greatest defenders of creation. He was a top man in evolution. Yes. And now he is just the opposite. Shame. It's but, a very interesting story. But he's being criticized because of his belief in uh, uh, conspiracy. Conspiracy. Okay. Uh, brother, I find this issue very close to heart. I don't know how to look at it in a, how should I say, detached manner. I'm very attached. In fact, I can tell you very simply that if at any point I were to be uh, begin to think in evolutionary terms, I would immediately lose all capability of thinking about God. That those two are, in my mind, not only alternatives, they are at cross purposes to one another. And it is, I, I, I feel intensely perplexed by the conflation that some of us seem to uh, be determined to pursue in an effort to somehow, uh, I don't know, uh, get a third alternative, which, which is, uh, well, which doesn't seem to me like a possibility. All right. Uh, how, do you, how do you combine Lucifer and Christ? My, my answer, and I'm thinking also of my colleague here, Jim, my answer would be that uh, I go back to a statement of Ellen White that in Steps to Christ impacted me as a young university student. And I still have that quotation. I read it in Spanish, and now I know it in English. Basically, she says that God, <laughs> God gives each human being enough evidence to believe and yet he does not she god does not eliminate the possibility of doubt so it is that to me is a because you need faith one way or another how do you read and i try to do that in my chapter how do you read interpret uh, the evidence and one of the sections of the chapter that is very difficult to abstract is one in which I make a contrast between biblical elements regarding life and death and intelligence and decisions and so on in the biblical perspective and the other in the secular naturalistic perspective. Once you look at that, your idea of a contrast and opposition is very sharp. Thank you. Um, we'll switch the microphone here and uh, then uh, we'll give uh, Jim Gibson a chance to talk about his uh, chapter and his thoughts on the book as well. All right. Can you, is this uh, connecting? I think it's working, is it? All right. 
Well, I didn't bring a PowerPoint. I just brought the book. <laughs> <laughs> you have the book, and I, I figured you probably you read what you're interested in. I'd like to look at the chapter that on, on what is creation theory. You might ask, what in the world are you writing a chapter like that for? Why don't you get somebody who knows something about it? Well, I think it might, it might be useful to have someone who comes at it from the standpoint of a background in science rather than a background in theology. There are lots of uh, theological uh, discussions of this. So uh, I hope that it's, uh, it's not too presumptuous to try to do that. Uh, the first claim I make in the book is that creation is a supernatural process. And therefore, science is not the best way to get at it. Probably it needs to be revealed. There's some uh, Science, by its very definition, excludes appeal to supernatural processes. Therefore, it, it sort of sets itself outside the idea of, of creation. And I, I would like to propose two criteria particularly, not, uh, not exclusively, but two criteria to sort through the ideas in the creation uh, story. So which ones kind of stand out? One of those criteria I would propose is when an idea is repeated, when you see it in more than one place. Uh, for example, of an of, of a idea that I don't think is repeated in more than one place, and one that gets a lot of discussion is was the sun created on the fourth day of creation? Well, does it make any difference theologically? And is there anything in the rest of scripture that repeats it or that applies it? And I couldn't find anything. Now there may be some implications and we can think about the textual, the exegesis and all that kind of stuff. But in terms of actual practice of religion, I can't see that that's a question that I really have to get consumed with. On the other hand, when it comes to the Sabbath, which is one of the things we're all interested in, I'm sure, there's a, there's a reference to the Sabbath here in, uh, in Genesis 2, the early in the chapter. And then there's or at least a rest on the seventh day, and, and, and Shabbat would be, uh, could be translated Sabbath, I suppose. And then in Exodus 20, and then Exodus 31, and of course Sabbath is uh, important all the way through Scripture. And Sabbath is an idea that we practice. It's not just some academic question, but it's an actual uh, something we practice. That to me is a more significant kind of implication of the story than, uh, than some, other, some others. The, uh, and based on that, I kind of went through and tried to, tried to propose what I would see as the really most important Things and, and I wouldn't say they're necessarily in order of importance, but I put the important, the most important ones I thought, at the first, and the less important ones toward the end, but not necessarily in absolute sequence. Of course, the most important thing is that God is a creator of heaven and earth. I mean, that is, that's basic. That's metaphysics, as, as uh, Dr. Rossi would say. That's what's reality, and and, and of course there are other texts. And one of them I think is fairly important is John 1.1, 1, 1, where it says, in the beginning, and it's clear John has read Genesis. He's thinking about Genesis. In the beginning was the word, and John identifies that one who, the Elohim, who spoke. That was, that was Jesus, the same person as Jesus. Of course, not in the flesh, but the, the, uh, God in the <laughs> divine form. The second thing I think is important is and this is more or less chronologically in the story, you have creation by fiat. God spoke, and it was done. And that's repeated, and it, that's a text, an idea you see throughout the Old Testament. When God speaks, his word does not return to him empty. It does what he says. It's effective. So here you have uh, uh, creation by fiat. There's no, uh, one of the reasons that, I mean, one of the things that kind of, you can draw out of that is by comparing it with some of the other, like Enuma Elish, the uh, Mesopotamian battle between Marduk and Tiamat and all this, where you have violence instead of just fiat. You have all this conflict going on, not in Genesis. God is just peace. I mean, everything's peaceful. What he says, it's done. That's it. I might mention another aspect of that. There has been uh, some discussion among some 
scientists and theologians, about God imposing his will on matter rather than allowing matter to be it, itself, or something along that line. This is almost, I, I think, a, a kind of a, a, an implication of pantheism, as though matter has some kind of will of its own and God has to force it into some sort of configuration. And, and you may see hints of that. I, I, uh, I won't, don't need to name the people, but uh, <coughs> anyway, creation by, by fiat avoids that particular idea for sure. Then another thing that I think is important, the six-day creation, and again, that's related to the Sabbath. Um, and if you were to deny the six-day creation, you would, you, you would, it's not just a matter of taking away Genesis 1, as some people would have us think. There's the, this, this theme is woven throughout Scripture. Uh, probably you've heard the story of Kurt Wise, who, who got his PhD at Harvard, and was a creationist and was challenged on this. And so he just does an exercise. And I, I think he did this literally. I haven't seen the effects of it, but he got a Bible and he got a pair of scissors. And he started cutting out all the texts that were related to, to Genesis. And when he got done, he had such a big pile of scraps that he realized he just, he couldn't, he couldn't discard that much without discarding the rest. It's just, uh, it, it's too integral to the, to the flow of the Bible. Another idea, and I think of all the ideas, this may, th this may be the most important in our own lives, and that's the, the humans were specially created in the image of God. If you take that out, the rest of it is, really loses a lot of its significance. But uh, with that in there, you have a, a, a worldview that I think is, is based on the Bible and uh, makes the gospel story uh, uh, coherent. One of the features that I like about the creation story is that, uh, with relationship to the humans, is that God creates Adam as an individual, then he creates Eve as an individual. He didn't create, you know, Mr. Elephant and Mrs. Elephant separately, as far as we're told. Uh, in, in separate acts, but humans, this, this, ten, this attention to individuality, I think has some implications for who we are as humans. We are individuals, and we are significant to God because we carry his image as individuals. That's an important point, I believe. Another, uh, uh, Dr. Rossi mentioned this already, and that is that you start out with a good creation, but something went wrong. If you think that you can infer God's character by just looking around in the world today, you're missing what Genesis is telling us in chapter 3 and what the Bible is about in terms of restoration. You're just simply missing that. And, uh, and I, I, I recognize what uh, Humberto was saying. Darwin himself struggled with this. And uh, if you read what he wrote, the problem of evil loomed very high in his thinking. And uh, there are th three examples that I have seen in his uh, experience. One is this matter of hell. And Darwin kind of figured that if there really was a hell, his grandfather, his brother, and most of his friends are, would be there. And uh, he didn't, that was distasteful to him. The second thing is that he lost his daughter, Annie. She died very young. And she was dear to his heart, as any daughter is to, his, to a father's heart. And this just was, just, just crushed him. And then the third thing, and it may have been in that sequence, uh, once he starts seeing evil, then he, he's looking at parasites. And he sees the ichneumon wasp that feeds in the body of a caterpillar and, and uh, devours it as it's alive. And he says, I can't believe that there's a beneficent God that would do that. And neither do I. I might mention Ernst Meyer also. Yeah. Ernst Meyer, the dean of evolutionary biologists, came, uh, the story is told, and I don't recall where I read this, but <laughs> apparently came from Germany to the United States in the 1930s. And when he arrived, he found, t 
to his surprise that the American scientists had a kind of a thing against God. They were, uh, they were militantly <coughs> atheistic. Uh, a person who's real, I, th I would propose that a person who's intellectually satisfied that there is no God may not necessarily be militant about it. He does just, if you know, if, if you don't believe that, well, it's to your loss. But these guys are militant. And he asked them, why are you so militant about it? And they gave two reasons. And one was a problem of evil. And that's, that, that's the problem that face, that's, that's one we all face. How do we deal with the problem of evil? Because we all experience evil. And the other one was uh, the lack of supernatural events. You know, I don't see anything. I don't see miracles going on. You know, where's God? And so we, we have to deal with those things and uh, recognize that they are, in fact, uh, challenges to our faith. Another item that I think is quite important in this story, especially in the present context, is that when the Bible, when, the Gen when Genesis describes the creation, it, there are separate creation events. The plants on day three, the sea and the air filled on day five, and the land filled on day six. They're not all from a common ancestor, but they're separate creations. Not only that, but the plants are not created in a single ancestor, but you have herbs and you have trees. And they're multiplicity. And on the birds, you have a multiplicity. And separate from the fish or the water swarm with living creatures, doesn't really say fish, I guess, but um, uh, many different kinds. And on the land, you have beasts of the field and beasts and so on, different kinds of beasts. Well, there's, there's plurality. So you're not starting with some kind of Darwinian process, uh, although Darwin did at one point allow that there could be a few ancestors. He breathed into one or a few, he says uh, at the beginning. But uh, clearly, Darwin did not believe uh, even in, in, uh, in God, although he allowed for it in his book. He later uh, chastised himself for truckling to public opinion by putting that reference to God breathing life uh, into uh, creation. The, uh, another implication is the age of creation. How long has it been since the creation? Well, if you read the text, you kind of get the impression it's been a few thousand years, but there isn't any text that says, here's the date for creation, nor is there any behavior expected of us based on any particular date. Therefore, for myself, I don't regard the date of creation as being anything too critical. Some people like to say 6,000 years, and I have no quarrel with that. But I don't, I, I don't wish to, to even to, to defend it particularly. It could be any, whatever figure. If you've got a figure that works and solves all the questions, I'll take it. <laughs> but if your figure, whatever figure you suggest, if it doesn't solve the questions, then I still want to leave it open, because I would like to have the questions open more than to have a date. The a final question, uh, well, two more points. The scope of creation. Here we get into a, a, a question that I don't think I have an answer for. I don't know. Maybe somebody does. The, what's meant by the heavens and the earth? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Does he mean the universe? Well, some people think he does. Uh, does he mean by heavens the same Shemayim that he names on the day of creation when he created the heavens on day two, and by the earth, the same Eretz that he means on day three when he created the, when he divided the waters. Is that the heaven and earth, the, the sea and the atmosphere, so to speak? Uh, just the surface of the earth, maybe. Another possibility is that when he says heavens and earth, he means the solar system that maybe uh, extends beyond the earth, but not the whole universe. Uh, as far as I know, the Hebrews didn't have any words to distinguish uh, the different parts of what we would call the universe. Uh, the, the starry ga galaxies versus the solar system versus the atmosphere. It seems like they pretty much used a one word fits all kind of thing. So it's, it's, I'm, I'm not too sure. However, I'm a little uncomfortable with the idea that the whole universe was created because I would include in the universe everything. 
Now, some people talk about other universes. To me, we need another word than universe for something like that. It seems <laughs> multiverse is almost an oxymoron, it seems to me. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you have in the garden, you, f you, you have a serpent. Where did he come from? Well, we, we're pretty sure that's Satan. There's some history behind Satan, which you read about in the Bible a little bit. There's the foundation of the world with the sons of God shouting for joy. That's described in Job. So you kind of get the idea there's a history behind, before the creation of our world. Therefore, to, it, I would not personally interpret Genesis 1-1 to mean the whole universe unless there is a way to do that. And that is to put a gap in time between verse 1 and verse 2. And you could have the whole universe there. And then uh, skipping down, first you have the whole universe and then you skip down to the local part, to this earth. And, and that's probably not ruled out, but that's not the only way to interpret it either. But the, uh, the scope of creation is, a, is an interesting question. Regardless of what the scope is of this specific word, I think the scripture teaches clearly enough that God is the creator of the universe and that he created it from, from nothing. And maybe we don't know exactly all the history of that. And maybe it's not that crucial to us. And then the final point, there's a global catastrophe, something that rearranged the surface of the earth. And uh, there are many problems in understanding just how that flood could have uh, created the fossil sequence. And I don't have the answers to that. But uh, we can see clearly in the geologic record that there was catastrophe. That's, that's, that comes out very clearly. And uh, we can also see in nature that there's design. That's very clear in nature, I think, that there's design in, in uh, living organisms and in the, in the structure of the universe itself. So that's, that's uh, more or less what I was trying to put across in, uh, in that chapter. I'm sure there's some errors in it. One error I should point out before, so lest you uh, uh, think that it's correct, is on the goodness of creation. I made the statement here at four points in the creation narrative, God states that what he had made was very good. And I got that from four days of creation in which he said that. <laughs> the, fifth day, the second day he didn't say that, and the sixth day he said it was very good. So on four days he said it was good. However, he said it was good six times, and it, should, it would have been better to have made that clear, but that's not at all clear in that the sentence there. But thank you for your indulgence on that. The other chapter to which I contributed has to do with speciation. David Cowles was the main author on that. And the, I, the, uh, the um, way, the structure of David's argument was to picture the evolutionary tree of life with its root and its branching points and to look at the root which would be the origin of life, and say, science has no answer for that. And then to look at the branching points and say, if you look at the branching points, you do not see what you expect to see on the theory of evolution. And I think that's widely recognized. Uh, and, and therefore, we would be better to view biodiversity not as a tree of life, but as a, an orchard, if you please, or a, if you would rather use the term phylogenetic forest, Many, many, many uh, different separately originated lineages, each of which could have branched off into multiplicity of species. I don't think God created 300,000 named species of beetles individually, but surely he started with some uh, ancestral created pairs, and from that there has been diversification in various lineages. And I'm not sure, oh, I, I think I wrote more of the fossil part there, because David wasn't, uh, wasn't prepared with his schedule, that he had, uh, uh, didn't have time to, to work on that part. But I think maybe, maybe that's the, the main part, unless you have, I may have overlooked, I'm sure I overlooked the stuff, but that's, that's kind of the thrust of that chapter, yes. We have a question here. 
And particularly in the proposed uh, explanation of the lineages, you would, according to the creationist model, uh, view the original parents in each species as starting out with the maximum genetic information and some of the descendants possibly losing some of that rather than the genetic information itself multiplying itself in successive generations. Yeah, I don't, you know, that's a difficult question to really analyze. Um, the, the, if you've read this book by James Shapiro that's just published this year, Evolution of View from the 21st Century, he claims the genome is a dynamic creator of information. And he provides some uh, mechanisms that he thinks works that way. Now, I think what he's doing is acknowledging that natural selection isn't working the way, you know, I think that's, what's, that's the problem. Natural selection doesn't cut it. And I think the, op, the idea that the genome might, it's kind of a possibility for an alternative explanation. So he's rushing over there with the finally admitting that natural selection is not sufficient to explain uh, biodiversity. What's likely to emerge from that, I don't know, but I, I see a, a possibility of pantheism arising from that idea that the genome is creative. That's kind of what you'd expect on pantheism. Almost like creating itself. Yeah, well, not from the beginning necessarily. Well, you, it could be, yes, if you have this uh, yeah. emergence and self-organizing properties and so on. But um, One question I'd like to ask people is, suppose we studied the genome of the humans and the chimp, and we discovered that by careful, carefully selecting three mutations, we could convert a chimp into a human. What would we think about or that? Or vice versa. Or vice versa. Yeah, what would we think about that? Uh, on the other hand, you see, we don't know. Yeah, yeah. We simply don't know. On the other hand, suppose in looking at those genomes, it was discovered that the regulatory proteins are so intimately tied to the specific sequences in the DNA that to, you couldn't, you know, to, to move one around would, or at least some of them, would upset things or that it would take 300 million or you know, some huge number of changes to change a chimp into a human we might conclude is impossible. So, you know, I, I think right at the moment, as far as I know, I don't think we know how much change and whether it is even possible to change like that. I have an even worse proposition. <laughs> Let's suppose, just for a Gedanken experiment, uh, that uh, genetically speaking, we were in fact identical, with the exception of how those genes just happen to be regulated. That's not too far from what it looks from the what it looks like, is it? You know. And and that's almost like saying, well, we're all using the same dictionary, but you could come up with many different books as a result of using the very same identical words. Yeah. Other other analogies have been to uh for to bricks. We're all using bricks and boards, but we build different buildings. That's right. Yes. Uh, it, it is a puzzle. If we're all that similar, why are we so different? Right. And, and we just don't, I, I don't know, anyway. Maybe somebody thinks they know, but I, I haven't seen a claim. As I understand it, there have been some uh, uh, studies that suggest that uh, the regulatory uh, sequences in, for humans and chimps are considerably more different than the uh, than the actual enzyme sequences themselves. Uh, that's my understanding. I'm not an authority in that area, but that's my understanding. That, that it looks like those repetitive sequences, which were, com which were thought to be junk DNA, which were left out of uh, comparisons when they compare the molecules, it appears that those are actually the ones that make the difference. Uh, Dr. Rossi, hit it. I wanted to connect what you were discussing in the chapter that you co-wrote to something that I think was a factor in Darwin's thinking. When he argued with the theologians of his time, the majority of them seemed to believe in the fixity of the species. Mm. Right. And therefore, he argued 
my servants in my farm can provide different species of, uh, of dogs. So that was a stumbling block for him. Now the approach that we have as Adventists today is that, they were, uh, that there was not a fixity of species, that the um, original model for a feline then diversified in different habitats and with time and so on. Yes, good. I, I'm glad you brought that up. The Christianity made some real serious errors early on. Uh, Augustine and uh, Aquinas, I think, had something to do with it. One of them, uh, that is in incorporating what everybody knew to be true into their theology. One of the things that everybody knew was that the earth was the center of the universe. And so it was brought in to Christianity. It actually came from Aristotle, I believe. The other thing that came from Plato, especially, is the fixity of species. And so that was brought into Christianity. And people said, well, we all know that. Let's find a Bible text to link it to. And sure enough, they could find some Bible text they thought they could link it to. Well, one of the things, that lesson from history kind of brings to my mind something that's going on today. Today we have some who would say, well, everybody knows that evolution is true. Let's bring that into the church and call it theistic evolution or evolutionary creation, if you want to call it that. We run the risk of exactly the same problem that happened in the past. Finding out what everybody knows, putting it into our religion, and then wait for the catastrophe to follow. Well, I hope we can avoid that. that. That is why I brought the statement of C.S. Lewis, mm -hmm. which is very insightful. I wish to, I hope to find the quotation, okay. because I think that that goes alongside your ar recent argument. Okay, very good. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, regarding, regarding the idea that God created things through evolution, it uh, looks like the number of Adventists who are accepting this idea is increasing. And uh, my question is, if evolution is true and we are making progress, what do we need redemption for? Of, of, redemption of what? Where did we, we haven't gone wrong, we are making it outstanding progress, let evolution continue. We don't need Je Jesus to come back. Eventually we'll evolve into something really impressive. I believe it was in the book, Three Views of Creation Evolution, uh, by John Mark Reynolds and Paul Nelson, that the authors wrote uh, an experience in a university setting where a group of Christian students were together for a little discussion. And one of them made the comment about how important it was to be saved. One of the young people in that group was a, a young woman of a favored, he said, a privileged background, who was apparently not a believer. And she looked up and she said, from what? There is someone here. Um, we talked a little bit about genetics. The question I have has somewhat to do with the fossil record, but more than that. And that's with the global flood concept, which is thoroughly entrenched within Adventist faith. And I believe also the flood was universal as a historical event. So I think a lot of us here resonate with that. Now, Noah's Ark is something that a lot of non Adventist creationists spend a whole lot of time on, as you know. And there's books written about it, articles written. And somehow we're trying to solve God's problems. And the problem that I see is if you have a bottleneck and it's happened about 4,500 years ago, how do you get all the varieties, all the species that we have today? Um, 
my my interest is in paleobotany, and there are over 400,000 species of plants, angiosperms, flowering plants, and quite often we say the flood ended uh, by the end of the Mesozoic, or at least early in what's called the Cenozoic, right after the demise of the dinosaurs. Well, you try and put all of the flowering plants, and there's not much record of them before then, put all of that after the flood. Do we have anyone from an Adventist standpoint working on this problem now? Maybe Tim is the main one? I don't know. I don't know of anyone working on that. I would point out that there's no connection, as far as I know, between the ark and the angiosperms other than that Noah may have taken a few seeds into the ark. But there is no, no statement in scripture that all the plants were destroyed True. by the flood. In that fact, Ellen White eliminated. suggests that God preserved them yes. in the crevices yes. and cracks of the earth. Right, and that after the flood, vegetation sprang up all over the place. So I don't, uh, the question of survival through the flood, I, it may not be what you're asking. Maybe you're asking about diversity. Well, if you consider hummingbirds, there's 300 species of hummingbirds restricted right. to the New World. And you could ask yourself, how long does it take to produce th 300 species of hummingbirds? Yeah, I mean, that's it's the same question. kind of problem. That's and hummingbirds probably were on the ark because they're terrestrial. <laughs> See? So that's, that's a, a problem. Well, we have different models of how speciation might work. Suppose you have an ancestral lineage that splits into two. And each one of those splits into two, and it takes a thousand years or five hundred years or whatever you say for one of those to happen. It could take quite a while. But suppose you have an ancestral pair of hummingbirds that spreads out over a large area, then in each area begins to develop local ad adaptations through genetic processes, which we, I think we have some understanding of that that can happen. You could get 300 species in one generation from one common ancestor. I'm not claiming that that's what happened, but I'm just saying that there, it, it's not necessarily a problem. You'd have to look at the data in order to know just how to deal with it. And it might even vary for different kinds of organisms. But I, I do think that speciation can occur quite rapidly. And the, the, the islands of the large oceans are good laboratories to prove this, especially Hawaii. Incidentally, I might say the idea that speciation took a long time came from the fossil record, where you see a species in the fossil record over what's supposed to be three million years. It's typically around uh, mammals one million or something like that, and invertebrates it tends to be around five to ten million years per speciation. Okay. When scientists are looking at what's actually happening in nature, they are finding that genetic changes are happening within as Hampton Carson said, once 10 generations, other people are seeing 100 years or whatever. It doesn't take that long. And so, as Stephen Gould asked, what kind of selective pressures would maintain a species in stasis for 5 million years? How is it possible? The environment's changing. You know, so something's wrong. There's a disconnect between the periods of time in the fossil record and what we observe in real life. I think, I don't know what time we close, but I... Um, yeah, Paul, I wanted to make a commercial. <laughs> these, these two books are available in the university bookstore and also at the ABC. They are not expensive. If you're interested in these, these are good books. Um, <laughs> it is now 11.30, and I know some of you have to go other places, so uh, those of you who, who uh, need to leave are invited to do so at this point. Um, this is we'll continue uh, questions as long as uh, our, our two uh, presenters are willing to take them. Uh, if, uh, I don't know, do you have an yes, appointment? Yes, I'm willing to stay here and answer questions. Okay. So uh, uh, at this point, we'll continue for those of you who have uh, more questions. Um, I'll, uh, I'll just make a, uh, a point, I think, uh, uh, and that is that uh, the same disconnect that you mentioned between speciation in the fossil record and speciation in uh, what I guess could be called real life um, also pertains to the fossil record uh, in terms of mutations 
in humans. Um, it was at one time thought that certain kinds of changes would take about uh, 250,000 years um, to get uh, all humans uh, from one female an ancestor, specifically the mitochondrial DNA. And when the rates were checked by actual real time, it turned out that the estimate was closer to 6,500 years, which of course everybody knows is not correct. Um, well, everybody except uh, some fundamentalists who, who uh, let their emotions overcome their, the, their belief in evidence. Um, and so uh, this sounds like a, a common problem uh, of the, the disconnect between how fast things happen in the fossil record and how fast they happen uh, in actual experience. I, I don't have a series of examples to comment on. <laughs> Berta, you want to come up here? Um, the, uh, the evolutionists base, seems like they base most of their theories, the primary part of their theories on focusing on the genetics, genetic code, and, and then I remember hearing this when I was a kid, you know, about, well, it, it, it changed mostly from what I had remember understanding this, that the, the gene, genes would, would be changed by either uh, radiation from the sun or something, and um, this kind of thing. Is that? The idea has been dominant that uh, evolution proceeds in very small steps. Those small steps are genetic and many of them could be just single nucleotide uh, changes, just single nucleotide mutations, yeah. and gradually over time they <coughs> accumulate. The problem with that is that most of them are thought to be at very best neutral, but more likely slightly deleterious. So that any lineage that accumulates a few beneficial mutations at the same time is accumulating even more, a greater number of harmful mutations and develops a genetic <coughs> load yeah. and is eventually going to go on extinct. And I think that's one of the reasons, well, first of all, from an evolutionary viewpoint, the fossil record basically falsifies that idea. You do not see a gradual change throughout the column. You see lots of gaps and jumps in the evolutionary scene. Um, that idea then needs to be replaced. And I think this idea of Shapiro's of the dynamic creative genome offers at least a possibility that perhaps this genome is exploring various combinations and maybe can reach a change in mutation through some threshold effect where once the number of mutations reach a certain level, then you suddenly have a jump and you go to another morphology or something. And so I think this is an idea that potentially might be uh, welcomed by the evolutionary community. But certainly the whole idea of one mutation, one nucleotide at a time over long ages, that doesn't work. Yeah. Um, the other comment was uh, that uh, now the uh, gorilla is supposed to have more uh, chromosomes than humans. So if you, if you um, put humans as the top of the chain, it doesn't make sense that the gorilla would have more. Well, the right? number of chromosomes is not, not a significant point. Mm -hmm. You take the same genetic information, you can divide it up into how many chromosomes you want. And the evidence seemed to suggest that humans, the human chromosomes, are the same as the ape chromosomes, except that two of the ape chromosomes, which are um, short, have fused at their centromeres and become a long one, a metacentric, I think they call it, rather than acrocentric. And so the, the information is equivalent. In fact, it's even used as an argument that humans evolved from apes because humans have s seem to have some evidence that, the, that there's a fusion there. But uh, fusions and fissions of chromosomes are not too, not too rare. There's, uh, there's many examples of that.
Don't forget Dr. Rossi here if you have questions on worldviews. No, my, my presentation was so clear. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I may ask a question, have you had any reaction from uh, university students who have read this and found it useful, not useful? Uh, I have not received any answer from students. Uh, you know, one question we had when we were planning the book was to whether to put our emails there. But I, I think that we withdrew from that uh, because w even I'm retired, I'm quite busy and I would not be able to deal. Uh, the book is, is slowly making its way in other places. It is being now translated into Spanish and will be published probably at the beginning of next year. There is a Korean edition that is being prepared. There may be a Portuguese edition. So uh, books uh, take time to take root. I know that some people in this area have read it and in other places, but they are not identified as university students. One, one colleague I had that teaches in university commented that it was not technical enough to be used as a textbook for major, uh, biology majors. But for non-majors, it, uh, it was useful for that. Maybe not as a textbook, but at least as a, a reference. So. And that was what was intended, really. Are you going to be putting it on e-books, on the electronics? Books? I don't think that Pacific Press is doing that yet. It is in their hands, perhaps. Mm -hmm. There is a question here. Yes, this is particular. Well, either of you, because you've been in a, an institutional Adventist milieu uh, for a greater part of your life. Um, I'm new to this kind of setting. I, I was born in the church, but in grassroots churches away from uh, educational institutions. So the the question that that uh, uh, perplexes me is how did evolutionary thinking ever begin to get a foothold in our institutions? In your experience, do you have some insight into what series of events transpired to allow that kind of development to occur? Well, I think it started out with uh, the Garden of Eden when God gave people choice. <laughs> well, as as you know, I think one of the factors is, as a church, we did not have very many people educated at the PhD level until about the. 40s or 50s, somewhere in there, and started to grow. Um, and we kind of grew up with this idea that we had the answers to everything. That Adventists always won Bible debates because we knew everything. And uh, then when you go to university and you start getting questions, you say, whoa, wait, what is this? I, maybe I don't know everything after all. You have questions I can't answer. And I think that that, dis I think that uh, knocked some people over. I think they said, man, I guess it's wrong. If I can't answer the questions, Adventism isn't right. I, I'm just speculating, but I kind of see that because I, I, maybe because in my own experience, I grew up with that sort of a feeling or teaching that we had the answers. And when I encountered questions that I couldn't answer, it was rather disturbing. I, I will add to, to the reason that he uh, alludes to. Uh, with uh, two ideas. First, it is not only in the scientific field That's true. that we have deviations. My friends in theology also take uh, a switch to a different rail and end up out. So, so it is not only in the scientific field that we have that. The second comment that I will make is to reflect, and I hope not to be offensive, because it could be a sensitive statement. Um, in the developing countries, like Argentina, where I was born and grew up, 
or Brazil or Uruguay where I live for some time. I find that educated Adventists have gone mostly through public universities. And that experience has been very, uh, has determined a conviction. You cannot be sitting on the fence in a public university setting regarding your beliefs. In a country like the United States, that is, you come steeled. You say, I am a Seventh-day Adventist. I will not have labs on Sabbath. I will not take exams on Sabbath. And if I lose my career, fine. I stand. That steals you to face anything after in life. If you move to areas like this blessed country that I have adopted as a citizen, where you float among great freedom and where Protestants have been the predominant belief for a long time, it is easy to move about. You may go through life without making too many decisions. It is, you know, you could be comfortable. In addition, in the developed parts of the world where there are Adventists, there is, and this perhaps is offensive, there is an inferiority complex that I have never understood. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I don't understand that. And it occurs in the most developed and richest and most intellectually gifted areas of the world. You find in Western Europe, you find in this country, and perhaps Canada, I know less, and in the South Pacific, Australia. I'm sorry, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. If I can pass on without standing up for it, the better for me. So there is a certain inferiority complex that I have never understood among my friends. I have dear friends here that have drifted away from theological beliefs, scientific beliefs. We should be here, in the humble sense of the term, proud of what Adventist represents, what we believe, what we think, the institution we have established. I read something interesting this morning. Um, Ellen White was commenting on this battle where they were supposed to uh, fight against a great enemy, and God said, no, uh, just give me, th and he boiled down who he'd only accepted 300 men. And those were the ones who just, you know, dipped as they were running through the stream, dipped their water, dipped the water in their hands, and, and kept running to finish the fight, and then the thousands who knelt at the bank and put their face in the water and drank from the surface of the water. And I thought, that's what some of us do. We're running an easy religion where all we have to do is drink from the surface, and we can kneel down and take our time. But those 300, they were determined to get on with the battle and to help win it. is for Dr. Gibson. Um, the, you've talked uh, a little bit about um, rapid development of speciation. And for, for a long time, the transfer from one species to another was considered inappropriate for an Adventist to consider because it bordered on evolutionary thinking. You're, um, you've, you're a biologist, and the, the GRI has worked in this area um, and is the, the, um, the Adventist's um, point of reference, if you will, for these ideas. Where are we today in terms of uh, speciation? Is it uh, something that we view as happening with great ease, or is it something that we view as um, taking a, a very long time and therefore undercutting uh, evolutionary ideas. I, I'm somewhat surprised at the um, discussion, the direction it's gone this morning, because there, there has been a um, e sort of a warm acceptance of the idea that hummingbirds could speciate into 300 species, um, I mean conceptually. Uh, 
And where, where would the GRI, what, what research has the GRI done, or where is our, our official position on speciation? Is it very rapid and, and almost trivial? Is it very difficult and takes a long time? Because I, I see a, a ditch on both sides of this road. If it's, if it's almost trivial to generate species, then uh, one of the strongest arguments against evolution has fallen. If not, um, we've got problems with the timing. And okay. First of all, uh, I'll give you my opinion, but not claim that it's GRIs, okay? No, but you are, in fact, <laughs> <laughs> responsible for well, GRIs. So. in any official sense, you know. <laughs> Because I, I would want my colleagues to, <laughs> to have to an weigh opportunity in on it. to weigh in on it. Um, speciation has a particular meaning of being, in, in the way I'm using it, in terms of being unable to reproduce. The establishment of reproductive barriers, if you want to call it, or the loss of the ability to interbreed. It does not necessarily produce any visible effects. One of the interesting things that has been noticed is that when people study the genetics of, uh, of a particular species, they sometimes find that, in fact, there are two or more populations that are not interbreeding, and therefore you have new species. In that sense, I suppose speciation could occur very rapidly. Now, the other thing is the morphological change that goes along with it, and that's Go ahead, maybe you want to... Well, I was just going to say, from um, if in fact all, all uh, creatures were originally created as vegetarians and um, speciation was responsible for producing the carnivores of the world, we've got a bigger problem than just non-interbreeding populations. We've got morphology that has to yeah. change drastically. Yeah. The morphology is, a, is another thing. So that, uh, once you have isolated two populations so that they're no longer interbreeding, then whatever happens in one population doesn't happen, and so you get divergence, of course. Uh, how long it takes for that divergence is, and, and there are some unanswered un questions in what you're dealing with there, of course. Uh, in the early 1900s, somebody had a couple of rock wallabies in Oahu that got loose from them and established a small population of little kangaroo-like things up in Hawaii. And that population has been studied and compared with what are thought to be the ancestral populations, and the difference, morphological difference, is equivalent to what you see in Australia of the different kinds of wallabies. I, I understand. I haven't, I mean, I've read the paper, but I haven't studied it myself, of course. Uh, and dogs are threatening that population in Hawaii. I don't know what the current status is. Green monkeys in one of the islands in the Caribbean have been there for, I think, 300 years. They're already distinct enough to be considered a morphological species if they were in Africa. And so some of these things take place rapidly. And in surveying what is seen in nature, morphological changes on minor morphological changes, but enough to distinguish one species from another, are being found, seen in relatively short times, on the scale of a human lifetime anyway. In that sense, I think that speciation is, at that level is not a problem for any, for any time scale that, uh, that's biblical. Now, if you want a problem, you can look at Madagascar, where you have these lemurs of various kinds. There's quite a bit of diversity in the lemurs on Madagascar, and you wonder how long would it take to produce that much morphological disparity from a common ancestor, which we don't know that it was a single common ancestor, but it seems reasonable to suspect it. And uh, I see that as, a, as a, a challenge. I'm not sure I don't have an answer for that. I don't know. That's again, I don't know how many genetic changes it takes to make a morphological change. And of course, which ones? Well, my question was though, if GRI is, is going to sort of harmonize and synthesize Adventist beliefs on this topic, are we, are we uh, now um, in favor of very rapid speciation or very slow speciation morphologically or genetically? Um, it seems to me that we're, um, not, we, we're not giving a uh, a clear answer to 
Um, and this, of course, is a fundamental problem for our students because when they go to, to universities and take biology courses, this is one of the things that comes up fairly frequently. What, what do we tell our students about the rapidity with which one animal can change into another? Well, the, uh, I, I, I would prefer to rephrase that. <laughs> Which one morphology can change into another, yeah, perhaps? Right. <laughs> um, well, a, a carnivore, for instance. Yeah. I'd start with a herbivore and change it into a carnivore. That's got to be well, something we've got to deal with. Okay, can we identify the genetic changes that are needed? I don't think we can, and therefore I don't think I'm prepared, uh, equipped to answer that question that well. The lengthy discussion of the rapidity of, <laughs> of speciation, I, I, I'm, I'm really um, stunned by uh, the thought of, of, um, of uh, hummingbirds going to 300 uh, species. They're, they're all, I presume, different, they're morphologically different as well as genetically different. Well, they're all in a single family. I know, yeah. So the morphology is not very different. Not as different as what you see among the dogs, for example. Okay. The feathers are different. <laughs> the bird watchers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I just want to uh, comment on this issue uh, to the extent the major problem that evolution faces is not uh, a question of rates of uh, speciation and so on. It's the fact that the groups of animals seem to be unique and you look in the fossil record and that uniqueness is, is maintained and that uniqueness develops very rapidly in terms of geologic time and as such uh, you don't have any confidence that evolution really took place in terms of uh, going from amoeba to man type of thing. Uh, there, the, it seems clear, at least in science, that, hey, this did not occur. Now, how rapidly species changed, uh, in a way, is it's an advantage to us because we, uh, people all keep raising the question, well, there's not enough room in the art for it. Uh, and when we can have a, at least a diversification going on since the flood, uh, it alleviates that question of, you know, how big was the ark? And, and calculations seem to show it. It's plausible, at least Wooden, Wooden Rapids' uh, calculations and uh, Morris's calculations, so on. So, uh, yeah, uh, you could have maintained at least those terrestrial animals uh, quite easily on the ark. I might say also, and this relates to Dr. Bull's question, there is evidence that mutation rates increase with stress, with environmental stress. So that throws a curve into this whole question of, of how fast species can change. Uh, it may depend on the environmental stress that they're experiencing. But again, we, until we can identify the genetics, uh, we're still speculating. Oh, yeah, that's oh, um, Let's see, okay. Is, now, like I was saying before, this is my other part of my question. Um, the um, evolutionists, basically, their their whole theory is based on the the genes changing, the genetics changing. Okay. I mean, there's nothing else that they really have, right? So, um, uh, reading about the the law of thermodynamics, and I don't know how much this really gets into that, but it seems like if if that was if that was the case anyway, it would be there would be like. Uh, you know, almost countless comparatively uh, mistakes than correct things, right? So well, natural selection is is a real thing that happens. Yeah. I mean, lame right. individuals don't run as fast. You know, they say if you're in a yeah. group, uh, if you don't have to worry about the bear as long as you can outrun one person. Uh, and, and the same in, in, in nature, um, the guy that's the slowest is the one that gets caught. Uh, and the result of that is that evolutionary biologists, and maybe you, I think I would agree, would say that the genome is not sloppily put together, but the combination of genes is going to be pretty good 
If it wasn't, it wouldn't survive. So any change in it is likely to be bad because natural selection has formed it to be good, that is, efficient. So that's why people would say you can't have big changes. You disrupt a well-functioning system with a big change, then it's not gonna do, it's not gonna work. You have to have little changes, but most of them are gonna be harmful because it's already at an optimal level. Right. So yeah. yes, it, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a difficult thing to get out of, I think. And, and there's no evidence in fossil records of, of much of this kind of thing. Well, you don't see general. genes in the fossil record. Well, I mean species. I mean species. Well, you know, the, the you fossil know, record is really mixed. I have yeah. seen some papers in which they say, here is a series of three sea urchins. One is ancestral to the other. Right. And I've never, I don't, well, I think I've seen some foraminifera that may have as many as five species that are thought to be ancestral to each other. But I've not seen any long sequences. The longest is the horse. Mm -hmm. The horse starts at 55 million years ago and goes to today. You start out with a little horse with five toes, end up with a big horse with one toe. And you say, at that rate, how long is it going to get, take you to get from a fish to a horse? And it's going to take a lot longer than geologic time allows. Right, yeah. So that's, uh, I mean, that's related to your question, too. So there's, there's something missing. There's, mm -hmm. something, there, there's something else going on somewhere. Yeah, well, Walter, I just want to say, Walter Vyth, which, which, by the way, they show the videos every Sabbath here at the library, below the library oh, okay. at the Brick Building. Um, for a couple hours, and it's very interesting. But I, I know watching those, he did mention the problems that were mentioned about, uh, you know, with the tiger, you know, it was an example of a tiger, how, um, you know, the, and that's Walter, I, I guess that's, that's basically his education is in something having to do with the biology of animals. He's a biologist. Yeah, okay, zoologist, biologist, yeah, is. zoologist. A lot of so, work in fish and physiology. Yeah, and also he handled some parasite issues, which, which was my other question, what, what you feel about the, um, I guess I've heard, well, okay, um, anything from the, the, the devil somehow or demons created the, these parasites or these morph, morphine of, of, of God's good creatures to become evil. And also my other question related to that is, why didn't that happen to humans if that happened to all these other, I mean, it, or are human or did it? Did are humans were humans a lot better, uh, like Adam and Eve? For, well, you for get the into you get into conjecture there. I, I would point out, uh, Ellen White does say that thorns and thistles are the result of Satan's ingenious activity. Now, botanists tell me that a thorn is a modified leaf. That somehow what should be a leaf has been modified developmentally into a thorn. Now, if Satan is what produced thorns and thorns came from leaves, that tells me that Satan can modify development. And if that's the case, that means he knows a lot about genetics. In fact, he knows more about controlling developmental genetics than we do even today. And if that's the case, then who knows what can be happened in morphology. But yeah, why, would, why wouldn't he do that to humans? Of course, that would well, be the key How do we know we didn't? Do you think we still well, look true. like Adam? <laughs> well, no, but I was mostly talking about moral character, but or that kind of thing. We're much reduced, apparently. What do you see on the mic? Up there, the next one. Oh. Uh. Who is next? Thank you. Okay, Dr. Gibson, you almost answered my question. Uh, my question was, God created in the beginning, but Jesus said, my father works and I work. Does that when we say God created in the beginning, are we assuming that God went on vacation, has been on vacation for 6,000 or 10,000, whatever number of years? Is he active in nature? Does he have a right to do so? And if he has the right, why do we need 
to assume that after creation, all we got is nature. All we got is speciation. Hey, uh, Genesis 2, 2. On the seventh day, God ended his work which, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. And in verse 3, he rested from all his work which God had created and made. It doesn't say he went on vacation. He stopped some kind of work, but Jesus said, the Father sends the sunshine and the rain. He's still working, but it's not the same kind of work. Origins and maintaining the universe are separate kinds of work. So God rested, and yet he works. That's the way I understand it. God can do whatever he wants, his world. Okay. All right. so we have the answer. But he stopped his work of creation at the end of the six days. He I, stopped, and on Sunday he said, okay, <laughs> now I don't have to create anything. Well, there are some theologians who believe that when God cursed the earth and the various things, that that curse was a creative curse, and he retooled it at that point. There is that idea too, and maybe that's true. I don't know, but it's it's not. I don't think there's a text that says that. I, I guess I have a question for Dr. Rossi. He doesn't seem to be fielding quite as many as. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you you said that um, there was a paradigm shift regarding continental drift. Yes. And um, I remember it well because um, actually. Uh, right about that time, I had been in the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey with, with uh, Peter Hare, and we were discussing this crazy thesis of uh, Wegener. And three years later, everybody had accepted it. it um, I, I remember very distinctly when it occurred, and it occurred because of the, um, uh, largely because of the stripes of alternate um, north-south uh, poles embedded in the. Um, spreading seafloor around the... Um, yes, the seafloor, yeah. right. But this, of course, uh, although it, it, it certainly undergirds your thesis and I think uh, proves that there are such things as, as um, paradigm shifts in science, but each time that happens, it presents us with some solutions and some new problems. And the problem that this one presented us with, as you know only too well, because we've discussed the fossils that are found on the on the side of Brazil and on the corresponding um, piece of Africa. It looks very much as though uh, they did separate. Right. Uh, we know they're separating at three centimeters a year now. Slowly. Uh, if you divide that into the distance they've gone, <laughs> you've got a lot more than a few thousand years. So uh, the paradigm shift um, has its uh, advantages, <laughs> and it's handed us a, a very difficult to explain problem here. Yes. And your, your personal response to the realization that if you divide three centimeters into 17, 2,700 miles, you get, you get a very long period of time. You are dealing with a non-scientist here. I know that, but this is, a, this is just straight division. It, it's well within your... <laughs> My area of interest. It's well <laughs> yeah. And because we discuss... I'm, I'm sorry, centimeters and kilometers, will that make it easier? Uh, the, the, the crux of the issue, and I think we touched it when we were in South America together, was at what time the continents drift apart fast in connection with they will be near enough to have the same species on both sides. Right? right? This yeah. seems to be yeah. the problem. You have to get them apart fairly quickly. In yes, order. you need to. It seems that they did move fast sometime in the past, much faster than now. And I, I, cannot, I do not know enough to give answers beyond that. I have, but, by the way, acquired a fossil from... From both sides. We need to well, go together to Namibia or somewhere. Yeah. Pardon me? Yes, yes, yes. Well, maybe I can point out something that's uh, interesting in this regard. I was just reading uh, last night, okay. in fact. Um, there are uh, several 
uh, different animals that do this, but the two that come to mind right now are uh, Old World versus New World monkeys and Hotsons. Uh, Hotson is a, a bird that has a hook on its wing and is supposed to be one of the more primitive uh, birds. It's certainly not a really strong flyer. And the, the interesting thing is that there are Hotsons uh, on both sides of the, uh, uh, of, of the Africa-South America divide. Um, but the fossil record does not go back to where Africa and South America connect. And in fact, the fossil record goes back to where South America was an island and the Isthmus of Panama did not exist. So however the Hotsons got there in, in the standard scenario, um, I, I mean, the, the hypothesis, I guess, that's kind of used is oceanic dispersal. Somehow there was this giant raft that a couple of, obviously it had to be at least two, uh, Hotsons got or a pregnant female. Uh, <laughs> yeah, although it, you, you try to think of the mechanics of, of laying eggs and making it all the way over there, uh, you know, it, it gets a little dicey after a while. Uh, but but at any rate, you, you can see the difficulties involved, and and um, you know, oceanic dispersal over something like estimated a thousand kilometers, uh, uh, six hundred miles for the uh, IUPAC uh, challenged people uh, um, is, uh, you know, it's a significant difference. And, and uh, at the same time, old world monkeys did the same thing. But curiously, not things like lorises, uh, which have a lower metabolic rate than the, the old world monkeys, which presumably would have had to make the, the trip. So um, while one can say that there are challenges to the, you know, the rate of spread and where it happened during a presumed universal flood and so forth, uh, the standard picture has some biogeographical problems as well. Seems that we are coming to the end and the scientist has left. So only questions dealing with epistemology or philosophy. <laughs> this, others are comments among yourselves. Uh, this, this is just a trivial comment about uh, parasites. Uh, you need to keep in mind that most parasites can be explained by both evolution and creationists on the basis of degeneration. Uh, and there are relics, biochemical relic, relics and parasites of uh, biochemical pathways and so on that are not functional anymore because of mutations. Uh, because and the parasite can get what it wants from the host, but obviously that parasite could do that because part of the biochemical pathway is there. Uh, type thing. So we need to keep that in mind. Uh, I, uh, with reference to this more recent discussion uh, about. Uh, you know, we, we pick the evidence that fits our model and present it and publish it and so on. Uh, I would like to see a very good statistical study. Now, as, as I recall, uh, before or at the time of the great, you know, the, the few years where we had ma made this uh, major shift between uh, uh, the continents don't move and the continents do move, and uh, I happened to be at the keynote address where that changed right there in Atlantic City and uh, Geological Society where they were they presented this uh, magnetic reversal thing at, uh, and that 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 paper closed the whole thing uh, it was dramatic but getting to this question of species on both sides uh, some of the discussion as I recall was that hey uh, we got too many species that are different on both sides and then some said, well, yeah, and they found some since then, and so on. And you find a species on both sides, and you say, hey, look, this is evidence of this. I'd like to get, see a good statistical, thorough study of that data. Which way is the data really? Because uh, before, it was used apparently as the difference 
and species was used. Hey, they couldn't be together. Look, we got a different, different, too many different animals here. And then when you get two together, you say, well, no, hey, no, this uh, obviously they were together, type of thing. I have not seen a good study on this. I'd like to see a good study on it. Well, um, epistemological question. The um, uh, you had a list there of what science says and what science uh, doesn't say. And I, I don't know how difficult it would be to pull it up again, but um, one of the things that you did, and I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with it, is that um, you, in, you, you, science, strictly defined, is methodological. It's a method for collecting data and publishing it and separating the, the interpretation from the data. And it's inherent in the very nature of science that you separate in your paper the data and then you have a discussion in which you say, my personal interpretation or that of myself and my colleagues of this data is the following. And the reason that science insists on this is that somebody can come along, take a look at your data, and come up with completely different conclusions. And that's, that's been true ever since, um, uh, well, ever since science was first clearly defined as a human pursuit. And I think it's helpful when you talk to scientists or about the way in which they operate that you make this, this, this division very clear because what typically changes is not the data itself. Um, usually the data is correct. It may not be as correct as it can be if you get a new instrument. Mm -hmm. But typically the data itself changes very little. It's the interpretations that may undergo radical change, as you illustrated in your talk with Continental Drift. And that distinction is not often made. People say science says this and science says that. Sci <laughs> uh, science goes out, collects the data, and publishes it. Individual scientists then interpret the data. And we need to make that distinction clear because the data hardly ever changes. The interpretations may undergo radical changes. I am comfortable with that distinction. Although in the scientific articles I try to read, that distinction is not always clear. Not good science. Yeah, and it appears in reputable scientific journals. Well, not, not if the editors are doing their business. Okay. But I agree that sometimes the data... It slips, sometimes it slips through, but that's what editors and editorial boards are there for, is to make sure that the distinction between what the data says and, and what this particular interpretation of the data might be is kept clear. Agree. The, in the book, by the way, there is a chapter dealing precisely with that, the distinction between data and interpretation. We're trying to see if we can get Elaine Kennedy to come and present that chapter. Yeah. Uh, there have been some difficulties with that. Uh, we're still hoping. Uh, but if we can, we'll, yeah. we'll have her actually discuss it. what is the difference between data and interpretation. And I think that will be a very interesting yeah. uh, presentation in this regard. Perhaps we can finish it. I need to go and, and listen to my pastor. Okay. <laughs>